at this point, I've uh, been testing it, where I see some output in the console. It is showing, at the very least, that whatever is being typed into those fields, I'm capturing them. So now it's time to check, does that user exist, and does the password match? So here's what we'll do some if-else statements. Um, so, back to our code here, after this console output line 61. We haven't been really writing comments, but uh, if else to check if the user exists to check local storage. If else this is an if else statement that will uh, we'll check if the user exists. So very similar to what we did about when we tried to save the user, we have to check if that object is null and such. This one um, is going to be very similar. So local storage. Dot get item temp val in email login. Let me let me do a quick little tangent here. Uh, I've done it myself, and I've seen people uh, do it in that you miss a capital I or a capital V or whatever. Throughout this whole class so far, we've been doing it the hard way in that we've got autocomplete turned off. And if you work with many code editors, they have something that's called autocomplete, which is when you've typed something, it will then pop up. If you're going to type it again, it'll pop up to say, why not let us complete it for you so that you don't mistype. And I've had it purposely turned off in this class up to this point. I think it's time we turn it on because it might be a little bit easier instead of retyping all of this and mistyping it. So. I'm going to save what I have here. In Notepad++, plus plus, the default is that it's on if you install Notepad at home. So you might have been working at home, and, and you get autocomplete at home and not here. Well, I turned it off here. Go up to Settings, and we'll go to Preferences. You will have to do this every time you come in because of the deep freeze software. Whatever you do on these computers will, become, will get erased every time you come back. So if you'd like to do this, you have to go back to Settings, Preferences. Then on the left side, you have Auto Completion. And at the moment, these, these are off. I would recommend Enable Auto Completion on each input, and Function Parameters Hint on Input. So this Auto Completion part, this stuff, uh, I guess you could turn this on if you want to. When you start a, when you start a parenthesis, automatically close the parenthesis. It might be helpful, or brackets or quotes. We'll have to turn these on every time. And sometimes it's useful, and sometimes it, it might get in your way. But we'll give it a shot by turning these on. And now as we type, we will get pop-ups that say, do you mean this? Then you can just select it, and it types it for you. I'm going to close all of that. I'm going to try this again. What I was just typing right here, I'm going to delete it. I'll start again. Temp. Look at that. It's suggesting all the possibilities of what I might mean. So as soon as you start typing a little bit, you can press the up and down arrow keys to select from what you've got there. What I meant at the moment was temp val in email, login, and then press tab. It completes it for you. So most code editors have this on by default to help you save all of your typing effort. And we have it also in Notepad. But just for us to learn and get used to it, I had it off. It is very useful to turn it back on because now you're going to make mis misspellings, and this helps prevent that. Outside of those parentheses, triple equals to check for null. 
Now sometimes, like for me, I just I type that so fast, not to show off, but I type that so fast, I don't need that anymore. And sometimes you're going to get these pop-ups that might get in your way, which then you can press escape to cancel the suggestion. So if else to check if the user exists. If we're checking local storage and it's null, which is empty, it hasn't been created, then uh, here is where we give ourselves some console output for the moment. And here again, con, it's suggesting concat, condition, cons, is suggesting console. At that point, if you like it, you can either double-click that selection or press tab on the keyboard. Dot log. Open parenthesis. It closed my parenthesis, so I don't have to remember to do it. Semicolon. But you do have to remember to go to the end of the line and put a semicolon. And here, uh, we'll do a little bit of output. Um, Again, this user doesn't exist. So open quote, ooh, end quote. This now here's where it annoys me. This user does not exist. Escape if you want. This user does not exist. And again, for further output as you're testing this, well, what user am I talking about? I'm talking about temp val in email login. Temp val. You can even type it lowercase. And it'll find it in your list here for a little bit of effort and saving effort, that is. You need temp val uh, in email. Temp val in email login. Just tab that. And this is some output in the console saying that user doesn't exist. Later, we'll make a pop up on screen to tell the person you don't exist, your account doesn't exist. You don't exist in my eyes. Okay, so else is the part where the user does exist. Console log. This user does exist. Temp val in email login. Okay, so um, we have, we've we passed our first hurdle. Does the user exist? Yes or no? And existence is based on the local storage object uh, of their email. Okay, we've confirmed that they do exist. We're in the else part. Now we need to check. Is the password you're typing in, does it match the password that we've saved in local storage? So here's another if else block. Here we can say, if else to check if the password matches from local storage. So this has an if else and if else uh, password, passwords match, and if else, uh, check if user exists. So we have uh, a temporary storage of the person's password. They typed something, we're storing it temporarily, uppercase. That's what we're going to check. Is the one we're currently holding in temporary storage the same as the one we have in permanent local storage? So we'll say here temp 
val in password login equals 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 local storage dot get item parentheses. Whatever they currently type, let's check if it's the same one from local storage. Get item. Temp. Now this is a little this is a little unintuitive. Um, temp val in uh, email login, not password. We're using the password, we're using the email as the key of what we're storing in local storage. What we're actually storing in local storage is the password. So here we're saying, okay, get whatever is inside of the email. We've confirmed if we're this deep into this if that that does exist. So get whatever is stored in that email and, and check it against the one that the person currently typed. So the two possibilities are passwords match, passwords don't match. That's the, point, that's the purpose of this if else statement. When we're in this level of, of it, we confirm the user exists. But now we're confirming if the passwords match. At this point, we can uh, test it. You've got the first part of the statement, you've got the login password, and you've got the email when you're asking those Yes, and I just explained it that the, in local storage, we're saving uh, oh, the key... Never mind. I got it. Yes. So, let's test it. Now, you have to remember what you typed in the previous password. Or look in the local storage viewer to remind yourself what was the password you saved. I forgot my password already, so I'll have to check it. But, what did I call my passwords? I have Bill Gates, AS, ASDF. Okay, so I'm going to refresh this. Um, log in with the user BillGates.com, password ASDG, just to trip the mismatch. Go. Passwords don't match. A moment ago, here I'm confirming ASDF. Okay, it's misspelled. Um, try that again. ASDF, passwords match. So in my local storage viewer, I can test the other account that I have there. Victor at victor.com, password ABC. Victor at victor.com. Again, uh, capitals matter, but because we have the two uppercase, then that's negated. It, it doesn't matter with two uppercase. So here, wrong password. I know it's wrong password. Go. Passwords don't match. The real password is ABC. ABC. I put it all lowercase. Go. Passwords match. So our sign up function created a user, saved their password. Our login function checks all of that at a subsequent time. Does the password exist? I mean, does the email exist? And does the password associated with that email match? So that's, that's here.
on this else about not matching, I want to do the same thing that I did when we were trying to create the account and the passwords didn't match. If they are trying to sign in and the password doesn't work, I want to clear that field, just like I did previously for creating the account. Um, so we can reference again the L um, in password login. In the login screen, the L in password login object dot val empty. I only want to clean out or clear out the the password which they mistyped, which they can't see what it is because it's under the type of password input. So then we'll have the output to the user that says uh, password mismatch that will pop up so they can fix it. We'll get to that later. But here in this else portion, the passwords don't match. Let them try their password again. Clean it out. Let them try their password again. That screen that we created last time, remember we've got the welcomes, PG welcome, PG login, PG sign up, one more. PG home, that's the one where the actual app starts, where you can start to save stuff and do stuff. So all of this is to check, does the user exist? Yes. Do the passwords match? Yes. Let them in. So we can jump from screen to screen in JavaScript. We had the mechanism of the person clicking the login button to go to the login screen, and the mechanism of uh, clicking the sign up button to go to the sign up screen. Well, now we only want to go from the login screen to PG Home programmatically uh, after confirming all of this stuff. So, very unique syntax here. Uh, dollar symbol, uh, dollar selector, the jQuery selector in the quotes, colon, mobile dash page container. This is a, this is a pseudo selector, which basically means the current screen, basically. Whatever the current screen is, dot, page container. method and everyone please remember to mute your devices please someone's getting texts messages so from the current um, selection of the current screen the page container uh, method we have um, we have uh, quotes change let's change away from, let's go to, let's change away from the current container, the current screen, to another screen, comma, quotes, PG Home. This is a way uh, to move from screen to screen programmatically via code. A way to move from screen to screen via code. Query mobile. So we can uh, trigger the ability to uh, move from screen to screen via a little bit of JavaScript here. Uh, current object, which uh, is a method that's changed, let's move out of our current page to PG Home. And we can also uh, feed in some uh, options, such as um, such as a transition. Uh, the default transition is fade. So unless we specify an alternate transition, it would continue to fade. I want to uh, flip from one screen to the other. So our syntax here is that uh, you have this argument, uh, the change event, um, to the target, PG Home, and then the options such as transition. 
in the syntax here is we've got curly braces. This is in uh, JSON format, basically. Quotes. Tr uh, transition. That line's getting a little long. Zoom in. Uh, transition. Outside of the quote, colon. Quotes again. Uh, and then the name of the animation, flip. So you have three arguments here. The event, change, where to, comma, comma, options. Options in curly braces. And then we've got a key and a value pair. The transition uh, key and the flip value. We'll deal with JSON format a lot more later on when we save data in the database. But at this point, we should be able to test it uh, so that if you log in with an email that exists and a password that works, if all that works, it should then finally take us to the PG home. Yes? Yes. Yes. Let's see here. Let's go ahead and save and test that, see if that works. Uh, sign in with valid credentials and see if it takes you to PG Home. Let me check mine. What's that? Drum roll. Drum roll, yes. What is my password? ABC. Go. Home. So the user exists, the password match, I'm home. Hmm. Let's pause there. Does that, uh, does that work? Kind of a long line. As we test this, and we'll address this, of course, as we test this, you will see, for example, if you close the browser or refresh it, it'll have you log in again. We, of course, will set it up that it will remember that you've logged in, because at the moment it doesn't. Um, the algorithm is not complete. So we will set it up remembering that you've logged in. You don't have to log in again. It will remember and automatically take you to home. We'll get to that soon. Does that work? Does that work for everyone? Question? All right, so um, the whole idea of taking, step, taking a step back again is this is going to be a way for different people to sign in and have their own collection of, of comics, their own inventory. One way that I want to remind that is once I've signed in, 
I wanted to have the person's email address listed down here to remind you who you've signed in with. So via JavaScript, we will be able to dynamically change that. Right now it says home or whatever's down there. I want that to change to show what the person's email address was. That requires a couple of little things for setup. One in HTML and one in JavaScript. So I want the person's email address to be printed down here on the footer. Back to our code and back to the index file. PG Home. Line 71 or so. There's the footer in PG Home. It should be the end of PG Home. It's just a comment, but um, I fixed that. So I want that text to change whenever we get, whenever we properly log in. So uh, one easy way to do it is to add an ID to that element so that then we can change it. Um, actually, uh, not an ID. This time we're going to use a class. We haven't dealt with classes much. An ID is a way to uniquely identify one element in the project, in the whole project. So only one thing in 5,000 lines can have that ID. A class, on the other hand, can be applied to as many other elements as we want, and they will all be affected the same way. So if, if we didn't know that, we can make a little note here. Classes can be used multiple times to name an element. IDs only once. IDs can only be used once. Should only be used once. Can only be used once per document. So if I have something called PG Home, I cannot name anything else. ID equals PG Home. That's a unique identifier. A class, I can borrow that and use it more than once because I may want to display the person's email address in more than one place. I could use IDs, but I'm probably going to write double or triple the code because I have to specify for each of those IDs, write the code to put the name there. If I use a class, I can use that as a sort of anchor to reuse and dynamically change it in multiple places. Class of user email. This is the email of the user. Once I determine what the user's email is, display that in the HTML everywhere where we have a class, anywhere that we have a class of user email. So if we have something with a unique um, uh, with a unique name as a class, it's a good idea then to create an object for it so that we can reference it easier in the in the JavaScript. So if we have a, a list of all classes stored, we just then need to specify which one or all of them at once because we are going to re reuse it. So. On your HTML, save that and switch over to the JavaScript. And then we'll go back to the beginning where we defined our sort of global uh, variables. Back to the top. Back to the top of JavaScript. We created the L form sign up, L form login. We're going to add a new global variable. So at the end of line 10, change that to a comma because we're defining another variable. Next line, 
l user email equal to dollar selector semicolon quotes. Since we're dealing with a class, we use a dot and then the name of the class. Pound equals ID dot equals class. All of this time we've been dealing with IDs. One thing only is named this. Here's an example where a class might be more useful. I want to put the person's email in 12 places in the app. So any sort of little placeholder I create and give it a class of user email, I can now reference it via JavaScript. And be careful here, the syntax is a dot, not a pound. Okay, the way we use this in our function of logging in, we had the, the if else uh, passwords matching console output that says the password match move us to the new page container page home. Before we, we move us to that screen, we will also write um, the email address down in the footer. So before that, I don't. I, it actually kind of works afterward, but I'd be feel safer changing that text first and then moving to that screen because there might be. Uh, an instance where a person is moving to that screen and then the old word th is still there and then it changes to the new word and they see it for a moment that it's at home but it should have been the email address. Uh, so we'll have this written first. We're going to say uh, the name of that object l user email dot html. Let's write some html down there. which is the, the email address that was used to log in with, which is temp val in email login. So in that object that is defined wherever there's an instance of an object with that class, let's write some HTML there. Let's write the person's email. Well, the person's email, if we use temp val in, temp val, this value up there somewhere, we turn it all uppercase. That might be fine. I want it lowercase. I only want it all uppercase in my database, so to speak. Visually on screen for the user, I want that to lowercase. We do lose that. We would have to do a little bit more programming to store an unedited version and then pull it up once we need it. Good point. So this will put it all lowercase, um, as opposed to all uppercase, which is what we've got stored in the database, in the local storage. Save it and run it, and check it out. Sign in with, with an account, with an email, and you should see that email address appear in the footer of PG Home. Give that a try. You should see an email address appear in the footer. Yes, let me confirm mine. It should be on the home page. Yeah, it should appear in the footer on the home page after you sign it. You might need to add the class in the HTML.
All right, so after you sign in, you'll see an email address down there. Um, if you press back and sign in with something else, right, uh, bill at gates, ASTF, go, the action of go, the action of login triggers the code to update the, the footer. Uh, and it changes. Now, me testing that by going back is not how it would work in the real device. Uh, yes, if this app goes on Android, we have a back button in Android, but we don't have a back button on other devices, such as an iPhone. Um, we, have, uh, we, ha we have to rely on the navigation in the app. So what I'm getting at is, another thing we need to program soon is a logout. I'm assuming I'm logged in, and in, in a device, I'm assuming I don't have a back button. So I shouldn't assume that, especially in this app, which we will see that we will be able to publish it to all devices. I need to think about that. This is eventually going to go on an Android or an iPhone. I can't rely on a, back, a hardware back button. So we need to create a logout system for it to take us back to, you know, this this welcome PG PG welcome. We also need to set up a way that if I were to refresh this, I want it to remember I'm logged in. I don't want to do this whole login again. That's going to get tiresome very quickly. I want it to remember I've been logged in. Keep me logged in. I want to create a logout. We can do the logout a lot easier. We'll do that one first. Then we'll do the then we'll do the remember that it was logged in. So for log out, um, for log out, this is going to be a brand new screen in in the app. We've gotten past PG PG welcome, PG login, we're in PG home. Now we're in the app. In the app here, I want to create some interfaces uh, for like an options screen. I want to add a button. In, in the corner to open up a pop-up for a for an options screen and various options and one of them is to log out. Log out will then take us back to PG welcome. So let's jump back to the HTML file first. Let's find your PG home. So PG Home, I'll clean this up just a little bit. It, uh, I don't really actually need it to say Home. I wanted to say the name of the app. Line, fi uh, line 59. In PG Home, our H1 will have it say uh, the name of the app, CBDB. Before the nav bar, for the nav bar, I want to create an, uh, an options button. This will be with an A tag, options.
href to a screen that doesn't exist yet, pound pg options. Then we're going to add some more attributes on this. Uh, data transition, pop. I have a different animation here because this is an example again of user, user uh, interface or user experience design in that this screen is going to appear differently to people, a pop-up animation to catch their attention that this is a different kind of interaction or a different kind of action that they can do in options screen. So the transition here is to pop. Then uh, the icon for this, um, data icon uh, will kind of work, but data icon assumes that your button, your icon, is going to appear on the left side uh, of the app on the top header. And that might work fine, but I instead want it to appear on the right side. And if we read the, the jQuery documentation, a lot of these data transitions, data roles, are sort of like shorthand, where we can override the shorthand defaults by using the collection of classes that are built into jQuery mobile. So all of this data transition, data role, all of that stuff, that it's shorthand, and all of that can be also defined via classes. So in this case, we need to do it this way, ui-btn. So instead of data role equals button, we're saying it in a different kind of way so that we can also manipulate where does it appear, no text, and that stuff. Space, ui-btn-right. Move the button to the right. Now there is a space here, very important. First of all, we're saying Activate the button view, the button roll. Then move the button to the right of the current container. Space UI dash BTN dash icon dash right. Uh, BTN icon right. Um, space uh, UI dash uh, BTN dash icon dash no text. Remember we had data dash icon POS equals no text. That was a shorthand. This is another way to refer to that. UI dash btn dash icon dash no text ui dash corner dash all uh, give rounded corners to the button or else it'd be a square button and finally the actual icon is ui dash icon dash info the info icon here we could put you know user data icon equals user here in the raw format, so to speak, is the class ui-icon-user. I want info. It's a space between all of these. So these are multiple classes being applied to a link element. And the reason, again, to do this is to override some of the defaults. The default of a button is that it shows the text and the icon. The default is that the icon will be on the left side. So I've overridden that by moving it to the right, showing no text. And that should be that I get the icon on the right side. icon on the top right. So 
my icon with no graphic, or no text, just the graphic info icon. You know, I have there's another icon that's kind of cool to use up here. Uh, UI icon gear that gives you the classic icon of, of a little gear that you often see as an options button in many apps or websites. So either one you like, info or the gear is fine. We also have another one that, that, that's useful called bars. That one gives you those three little lines, the hamburger menu that you might have heard of. You know, those three little lines to open a more, more view, whatever, bars. So we have info, gear, or bars. And you can go look up the other icons that might work under uh, jQueryMobile.com. So choose any one of those three. Uh, I think I'll stick with gear. Gear icon, although it kind of looks like a sun also, maybe. We have bars. Gives you three lines. There's another one. Bullets, I think. Bullets. Yeah, gives you that. So whatever icon you think represents an options screen, you can use that. You know, obviously you don't want to um, use the wrong icon if it's got a meaning. Okay, I'm going to take a photo right here. No, it has the meaning of I'm going to take a photo, not go to options. Or I can design my very own icon. If you go back to jQuery Mobile, read how to do that, you can design your own icon that represents options. But the, fil the 50 that are built in, I think, are very good to, to guide people in a basic way of uh, what, it, what the button means. I'll keep gear. <coughs> We'll do one more thing, and then we'll take a break. Um, this button up here, it uh, looks like a button, but it doesn't quack like a button yet. It looks like a button and walks like a button, but it doesn't quack like a button yet. It doesn't go anywhere. If you click on it, nothing happens, or you get an error or something. It doesn't go anywhere. I need a screen to show my options. So this is some more HTML. This is a plain old H this is a pan plain old jQuery mobile button. It's not anything special with JavaScript. It's just going to open a screen full in in HTML. So we need to create a uh, a section for options, a screen for options. If you have your template, I want to borrow most of this to create. I'm going to copy and paste most of that to create a brand new PG options. So if you're borrowing my file, you should have a section jQuery mobile template before your libraries. I'm going to copy all of that and paste it above and rename some of the details. So now I've got start uh, options. This is end options. PG options. Because that's what I named the href up there. I don't need this complex nav bar. We don't need that nav bar. We'll need a way to get back. We'll have that in a moment. Uh, oops. Where am I? Not home. Right here. Options. Yeah, PG, PG options. Uh, so you don't need the, the nav in PG options. The top of that will be uh, options. I don't need a footer actually either. This is just for aesthetics. You can keep it, it'll work, but the design that I have in mind, I don't need the footer. I don't need the nav or I don't need the footer. Uh, we'll fill in some real stuff here in a moment. PG options, header, etc. What we do need is a way to get back. If we get this new screen that pops up, we're stuck. We don't have navigation. We're not going to rely on the back button. So we have the we have the way to go back. Oh, actually, 
this one's good here actually uh, because we're trying to create a, uh, a pop-up we do have another kind of uh, data role um, this options I don't want it to be like a full screen page that was data role page I don't want it to be a full full screen I have another attribute that I can add so that it acts like a dialog like a pop-up so keep it data role page and then we add another one data dialog equals true so it's a it's still a whole page of content but don't make it fill up the whole page the whole screen make it behave like a dialog box a dialog box is different in that it seems to hover over the other content and this should automatically add also like a close button to close the options screen. This is built into jQuery mobile. So checking that have to do the whole sign-in stuff. So I'm signed in. I can then click the Options button. Get a pop-up. It looks different. The rest fades away. This one pops up into view. It's got an automatic close button. There's the heading one. I don't need that special navbar. I don't need a footer. Close that. It automatically takes you back. So that works because on any screen, any page, if we further add the data dialog true attribute, it behaves like a pop-up box. Let's um, take our second break here, if all of this works. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll check it. But now we've, we're going to set up this options screen so that we can set up a logout <coughs> functionality. It's about 8.20. We'll take a break until 8.30, and we'll go on.